Mr. Cattle, thank you for opening your doors to Africa Media Australia. Thank you for the uh, opportunity, Claude. All right, you were recently reported expressing concern over African youth crime through an article that was published by The Age on the 20th of August. The statements you made in that article have raised a lot of concerns yes. and even anger from some members of the African Australian community across the board. Can you please clarify why you made these statements and in what context? Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity to talk about this, Clyde. It certainly wasn't our intention to cause this sort of damage and it wasn't our intention to focus specifically in the way that it's been portrayed. What the situation was that we'd been meeting with representatives of the African community and other government agencies for some time to talk about ways that we could deal with the problems that we're seeing in um, the community. That's not unusual. We do that with lots of communities. Um, at one of those meetings, we actually provided some data to the people present. In a, within a very short time, a journalist came to us from the age, had obviously had access to the data and sought the statistics, actually asked for the statistics. The decision we had to make then was, do we resist? Do we try and deal with the story in a manner that might be more productive? Do we remain silent? Um, rightly or wrongly, I chose to be interviewed by the journalist and to give him those statistics. He would always have been able to get the statistics one way or another. Um, unfortunately, it didn't come out the way we'd liked it to have come out. It's actually done quite a bit of damage, I think, and, and I'm sorry for that. All right, so are you saying you were the police were responding to media solicitations? It wasn't a proactive step that was taken to go into the media to talk about these uh, statistics? No, exactly right. We, we didn't, our preference wouldn't have, would have been that they didn't become public, and certainly not in the manner they did. The journalist had access to material. It wasn't the same statistics, but it was very similar. So that was the choice we made. And uh, in that article, uh, some of the statements uh, that you are reported to have made uh, uh, make reference to Cronulla and London riots. Uh, can you tell us why uh, you made those uh, reference? Yeah, uh, Clyde, like you and I are talking now, we had a conversation with a journalist over half an hour. And towards the end of that interview, one of the things I was trying to say to him is, if we don't deal with disengaged youth in the long term you end up with very, um, you, you, you end up with long term disengaged kids who are very problematic and who don't have opportunities. What I was trying to say is always we're trying to deal with problems early on so that in 10 years time we don't have the sort of problems that you might have seen elsewhere. But do you understand that uh, that simple uh, comparison with uh, Cronulla and London uh, um, may actually uh, go the other way and, and provide a more negative sort of connotation to what you were saying? Yeah, and that's what's happened now. Um, I don't think it, I don't think the journalist reported it in that manner, but as often happens with the headlines and the, and the, some of the quotes that the sub-editors use, it certainly came out that way. Certainly not my intention, um, and I won't be using that comparison again, but I still try and portray the message is we have an opportunity now to, to intervene, to get some things going for young people that will make sure that we don't have, in 10 years' time, disengaged young African people. And... Getting back to the meeting that you organised prior to uh, the, uh, statistics, uh, the statistics being released uh, uh, for that article, um, I guess now that the, uh, the overall st statistics have been released, we understand that the crimes committed by Africans, uh, youth groups um, yeah, from African background, are less than 1% of uh, the overall crime. Uh, basically, why did you have, in, in the first place, you have to have that meeting uh, uh, if uh, the level of crime is uh, so low? So the total numbers of crime are low, but the um, number of people charged per head of population are very high. So while it's a small contribution to the total number of crime for the population, it's still quite a high, uh, quite high and quite concerning to us. So we're working with the community, with the leaders, to try and develop strategies to overcome that, to address that. And uh, for instance, it's one of the also one of the statements you made saying that um, African youth are, you know, likely five times to commit crime than m members of the wider community. Yes. Um, if we look at youth, youth generally, uh, these uh, groups tend to commit more crime than the rest of the uh, the community. Yes. Do you know, uh, for instance, the same statistic? for Caucasian youths uh, compared to the wider community? Yes, I do. We've actually done some work around that. Um, and while it's um, less concerning, it's still a concern. So the African youth, even compared to other groups of youth, uh, are still overrepresented. But how much? Um, like I couldn't give you exact figures, but it's, say, twice, 
generally. Um, again, I, don't, I, I can't give exact figures, but it's in that sort of border of magnitude. And wouldn't that be sort of the uh, g general figure for all youth groups? No, I'm saying compared to other to other, oh, youth, to other groups. youth groups. So when we adjust for age, it's still a, an over-representation. Clive, we need to put this in context too. Um, this is not new. So we would have seen the same thing 10 years ago with, with I don't know, Vietnamese youth or earlier with um, Lebanese youth or Turkish youth or Greek youth, particularly when you get young people so often um, from these young people come from war-torn backgrounds, from uh, refugee camps, have enormous problems in their lives. What we were trying to achieve is to recognise that and to work with, work with the young people so they actually do have access to education, they do have access to employment so they do have the opportunities that other kids in our community have okay many african individuals and community leaders and even youth groups think that your statement in the media uh, amounts to racial profiling what have you got to say to that so I, I, i've spoken to you about the background as to why it occurred um, you know look i've ever since that article of course i think about what will we have done differently um, i'm still of the situation where the material was already out there we made a choice to try and influence it. Uh, on this occasion, that didn't work. And also, uh, actually getting back to the meeting that was organised, apparently it, it said that the police uh, only selected a number of uh, uh, people who went to that meeting. It wasn't widely publicised uh, within the broader African community. Uh, is that correct? Yes, and, and that's not unusual. Um, it wasn't intended to be a community consultation. This is a group of people who we thought might be able to help us or might be able to influence actions in the um, in the community. So we met with that group. It was a small group. Um, one of the intentions was so that the material we're talking about didn't go more widely. That didn't work. And some say um, you only select the people you sort of work with um, and uh, not the rest of the community because uh, they probably wouldn't uh, agree and you had some hidden agenda in doing that? Well, we're always going to be criticised for that. I think we find that with any group, you, you choose people, then others will say, well, why didn't you choose me? I, I represent this group more broadly or I represent that group. And that's one of the challenges we have um, working with any community group. Do you fear that uh, because of this uh, uh, type of uh, media publications, and I understand a degree of it has been blown out by uh, uh, the media, but uh, the fundamentals of it may actually end up uh, hurting uh, uh, Africans more than they help, uh, it, it, it helps them? But that's, that's certainly a concern, and looking at the reaction and, and listening to the, commenta uh, the commentator since, that's certainly a concern, it's certainly something that might have happened on this occasion. Which is one of the things I'd like to draw a comparison with. Around the same time, we actually publicised some work that um, police and um, young, young African people in the Dandenong area are doing around African youth leadership. I mean, that gets very little coverage, but when you, you, you get this sort of sensational material, it gets much broader coverage. Yet the, the interest is in the bad stories, not in the good stories. And the police has a lot of experience dealing with the media and uh, with your experience as, as, uh, as well as an assistant police commissioner. When you have had that, that, that interview with the journalists, do you take any precautions to uh, uh, some degree, because you may not, may not control much what the media does after that, but was there anything that you did in particular to ensure that uh, it doesn't get uh, taken out of context? Well, we knew that the, that the journalist was talking to at least one other African community leader. Um, and we were optimistic that the story would come out in a way that was supportive to say, here's a problem, we're working on it, we need community help to continue to work on it. It didn't get interpreted that way. And I'm still not sure that that was even the journalist's fault. Um, I think the journalist had the best of intentions in, this, in publishing the story. You know, you, you say, I'm experienced, but, um, you know, it, it, one of the challenges of my job is is balancing the right, the need for the community to know, to be able to be engaged, and being being seen as alarmist. So on this occasion, it was seen more as alarmist than helpful.
And what is the police doing, uh, knowing that obviously uh, there is a, a level of crime within African youths that needs to be um, uh, addressed? What is the police doing specifically uh, in helping these communities? So I, I spoke about then about the African uh, Youth Leadership Program in Dandenong. Uh, we've got similar programs in Footscray. Um, the the uh, Dandenong one is a really good example where young people, young potential leaders from the community are actually doing um, skills courses. They might be skills around leadership, they might be skills about communication might be other useful skills that will help them. Um, in, in Footscray there are more generalist courses. We've been doing similar things in uh, Sunshine and the Brimbank community. Uh, we, you, as you'd expect, we try and do the interactions too at the, at the local level, the football games, um, those sort of events, so the police, young police, young Africans experience each other in a non-threatening way. And are these uh, police-initiated, uh, Victoria Police-initiated programs or are they just uh, programs from anywhere where Victoria Police comes into it and trying to um, make something out of it uh, in, in, in the best way? Uh, it both. I mean, one of the things I, I need to say is we can't do this alone. We need the community to help us, which is what, what, what we were trying to achieve there. It was one of those things. So none of these programs would work with just the police and they probably wouldn't work as well with just a small community group. Challenges like this need the, the community, the government agencies, police, all to work together. And um, some African leaders uh, have said uh, um, they fear that um, because of this type of uh, incident, uh, it is likely to be an increase of uh, police uh, harassing uh, uh, African persons or African youth uh, because uh, they kind of uh, may interpret that they're getting an okay from, uh, from the top uh, in uh, addressing uh, crime. Yeah. Well, I certainly would hope that that's not the case. Um, it's never the intention. The intention was exactly the opposite. The intention to say, we've got a problem, we're aware of that, we're working on it. Um, again, I can just say that uh, we've worked through similar problems with lots of other communities. We just, and we need to keep working on the problems we have. It, it's, you can't set up one program and then think it's fine. These sort of relationships take years and we continue to invest in all sorts of community groups. And even before this incident, the relationship between some section of the African youth and the police was not at, it, at its best. Uh, now this will make it things even harder. Is there anything that uh, the police, uh, Victoria Police, is doing to uh, address this? Um, we continue with the programs we've got. So we can we've got community liaison officers who specifically deal with these programs. Um, they know our thinking on this. I'm talking to you. I try. We try and get the opportunity to say, look. This is not the story we're trying to portray and not the intent of what we provided. But that's always going to be challenging. Um, since that article, I've done another interview with another journalist who'd been out, Sunshine, Brimbank, um, those areas, and actually had good stories to tell from the community and from the police out there, which is really encouraging. So we can only try and portray those good stories um, and the challenges that we all face in a positive light. Some of the stories we hear uh, from the community is that apparently as part of the police uh, training itself, there, there are some elements of um, uh, racial profiling uh, in a way that uh, police are, are trained to deal with uh, uh, African youth. Do, do you agree with that? So are you saying that there's training that that's would, would lead to racial profiling? Was that what well, you're saying? Yeah, apparently uh, uh, some of the training, the way it's conducted, uh, it, uh, it may encourage uh, uh, targeting a section of uh, uh, the youth that is perceived to be problematic and uh, uh, African uh, youths are, are one of them. No, look, I'd be interested to hear of any more details as to where that's occurring. Um, our initial training and our continuing training is, is the opposite. It is about working with all sectors of the community. And I think we've actually got a reasonably good record on that. Um, so I'd be very concerned if that's, if that's being said. One of the things we do have to recognise, though, is part of our job is to police is to identify high-risk times, locations, age groups, people. We do that. That is part of the job that I think the community expects us to do. And given all that has happened, uh, how do we start repairing, uh, I guess, uh, the relationship? This incident, uh, as you would you would know, is, is really making things harder. Is there anything specific that would come from this to um, address um, the relationship between Victoria Police and, and Africans? Well, this interview is part of that. 
We look for opportunities like this to explain what's happened and why it's happened, to express our regret. Um, I've asked some of our people to, see, to look at the, the opportunities for conducting other meetings with African leaders, but then the last time we did that, it wasn't as productive as we held, as we hoped. Um, I know that there are um, uh, meetings coming up in the near future, so we'd be interested in, in the opportunity to speak at those. And it, it looks like uh, um, there's a lot of meetings that happen um, in terms of uh, actually trying to improve the relationship between the police uh, and uh, and African communities, but not much happens uh, after those meetings in terms of the real programs or real thing that uh, uh, that can really impact uh, in this relationship. I don't agree, Clive. Like I've spoken about the Dandenong programs. There are a lot of programs being worked in Footscray. Um, for five or six years, we've been working hard in Brimbank Sunshine. When I was a superintendent there in, I think, 2006, 2007, we worked with Victoria University then to identify the challenges, to talk about ways that we could better communicate with African youth. We've been doing this for a long time, so to say that nothing comes out of the meetings, I don't think's fair. Okay, have you got anything to say about uh, stop and search? There's been a number of uh, concerns that relate specifically to African communities, especially in the Flemington and uh, in the F Full Square uh, area. Can you tell us anything about that? Yeah. Uh, one of the things that our, um, that our intelligence does tell us and that we do know is that we're getting robberies by groups of young men. Um, that is clear. It's uh, not just African young men. It might be white young men, mixed race groups of young men. But the common theme is that groups of young men are committing robberies in the street and they're very violent. As part of that, uh, one of the things that I'd require my police to do is to talk to groups of young men. Uh, we, we, we would be looking to make sure that if they're going out, that they've got good intentions that they're not alcohol affected, that they're not carrying weapons. So part of our routine operations, I'd expect police to stop and talk to those young people, particularly if they're in um, public transport locations or they're in the CBD, those sorts of areas. But it appears that uh, in using that power uh, and addressing that problem, some section of the youth, especially uh, African youth, are being uh, targeted more than others. Yes, yeah, and I've heard that. Um, we're concerned about that. Um, the, the reality is in some of the areas you're talking about, there are more African youth than there are other, other groups, but they shouldn't be targeted. What I would expect to be seeing is that my people are talking to groups of young men, no matter what their culture, no matter what their background. With regards to uh, that use of power for stop and search, is, uh, has there been any evidence of, of, of abuse by members of the Victoria Police? Look, from time to time, my members will make mistakes. That happens. Um, I won't say there's no evidence that people in the past or in the present won't do things wrong, but we need to hear about those. But say, by and large, uh, our people are doing the things that we need them to do, and that is to protect the whole community. Some youth uh, have indicated, for instance, uh, in, and I know this specifically from the Flemington area because I interviewed one of them recently, uh, when they've been having a lot of issues with uh, members of the police, they see even sometimes that the same members of the police that they've been having issues with when they moved out of uh, Flemington, they actually promoted instead of demoted. What have you got to say? Well, I don't know. I'd need to hear the specifics. Um, if there are specific examples, and it sounds like this is one, I'd be very interested to hear about those and to pursue them. I'm not saying that our people don't make mistakes, and I'm not saying out of 15,000 employees, we don't have some who do the wrong thing. But I'd be very interested to hear about them and we'll investigate them. Are you prepared to apologise with regards to the, these uh, media statements that have been made? I think, Clive, I did early on. If I didn't make that clear, I am sorry for the impact that's occurred. The challenge for me is I still say, what would we have done differently? And any last message um, beyond that? Yeah, yeah. This, I mean, this was deeply regretful. For what happened, this is very counterproductive. What we're trying to do is the exact opposite to what happened. So th that is um, something I regret. Um, something I'm very sorry about and something it'll take a lot of time for us to recover but we still need to work together to, to meet the challenges that our young people have and it's not just African young people but in this case that's what we're talking about. Mr Cuswell, we thank you for your time to Africa Media Australia. Thank you. Thank you.